Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're going to give it a minute or two just to let people file in. All right, um, we'll go ahead and get started. So hello everyone and welcome to the latest event in our IHL primer series. So today we'll be discussing classification of conflicts and the legal frameworks that help us to determine which IHL rules apply in situations of armed conflict. So my name is Olivia Kempf and I'll be your presenter today. I'm a legal intern with the IHL team here at American Red Cross NHQ, and I'm also a rising 2L at American University Washington College of Law. So throughout this webinar, feel free to use the Q&A portion um, on the Zoom to, or the Q&A function to submit any questions that you have. I'll leave some time at the end to answer them. And we'll also have an interactive portion towards the end. So feel free to take notes if you'd like to. Before we dive in, it's important to recognize why classification matters in the first place. The key is that IHL only applies to conflicts. It does not apply in situations that do not qualify as conflicts. And these are things like internal disturbances or tensions and isolated or sporadic acts of violence. Different IHL rules also apply to different types of conflicts, with the main distinction being between international armed conflicts or IACs and non-international armed conflicts or NIACs. Today, I'll be walking you through the requirements for establishing each type of conflict, the IHL rules that apply once a conflict begins, and the key distinctions between IACs and NIACs. So let's dive into the first and probably most famous type of conflict, the International Armed Conflict or IAC. The definition of an IAC is spelled out in Article 2 common to the Geneva Conventions, which specifies that the conventions shall apply to all cases of declared war or of any other armed conflict which may arise between two or more of the high contracting parties. From this definition, there are two ways to establish an IAC. The first is through a declaration of war from one state against another. The second, when there may not be a declaration of war, requires certain criteria to be met be before a situation is classified as a conflict. Now, all 196 currently recognized states are parties to the Geneva Conventions, so this provision triggers application of the conventions to all situations of armed conflict between states that meet the necessary criteria. So what are the necessary criteria to establish the existence of an IAC? A rule of thumb for IACs is that if there is a state involved on both sides of the conflict, it is generally an IAC. For an IAC to exist, there needs to have been an act of violence against another state. An act of violence means that force is used to which the attacked state did not consent. Though there are differing understandings across the field on how much force is required, the ICRC has specified that there is no specific requirement for an intensity of violence, and that even the capture of a single soldier is sufficient to trigger an IAC. The act of violence can be directed against anything or anyone that in the attacker's view represents the opposing state. This is often fulfilled when the act of violence takes place on the opposing state's territory or against its armed forces. The requirement of against another state means that the adversary must be either the official or de jure government of the state or the party with effective de facto control over the state. So this means that the IHL of IAX can still apply in conflicts against groups that though they're not the officially recognized government of the state, they're exercising effective control over its governance. One of the most famous examples of an international armed conflict is World War II. So let's see how the criteria that I've discussed would have applied back in 1939. On September 1st, 1939, Hitler and the German forces invaded Poland. Now this constituted an act of violence against Poland and therefore established an IAC between the two countries. And two days later, based on their alliance agreements with Poland, Great Britain and France declared war on Germany, 
And I point this out because as we remember from common article two, a declaration of war is also a sufficient basis for establishing an IAC. So this action established additional IACs between Britain and France on one side and Germany on the other. The IHL of IACs comes primarily from three sources. The four Geneva Conventions established protections for wounded, sick, and shipwrecked members of the armed forces, for prisoners of war, or POWs, and for civilians. There are also 161 customary IHL rules, all of which govern IACs, except for those few that are specifically created to govern non-international armed conflicts, NIACs. An additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions is specifically applicable to IACs and expands upon the protections outlined in the Geneva Conventions. AP1 also expands upon the definition of IACs, adding national liberation wars to the situations where the IHL of IACs will apply. So what is a national liberation war? National liberation wars are defined in AP1 as armed conflicts in which peoples are fighting against colonial domination and alien occupation and against racist regimes in the exercise of their right to self-determination, meaning their right to self-governance, which had in the past been denied. An easy way to remember the three types of national liberation wars is by the acronym CAR. So colonial domination is when a colonized people takes up arms to free itself from the domination of another people. Alien occupation includes cases of total or partial occupation of a territory which has not yet been fully formed as a state. So its people have not yet been able to exercise their right to self-determination. Finally, racist regimes are regimes founded on racist criteria, where one group is given domination over another in accordance with racist ideas. Now, the addition of national liberation wars to AP1 was largely reactionary, as this type of conflict had become much more common in the years before AP1's adoption in 1977. There are two other common situations where the IHL of IACs applies, even though it might not be immediately obvious that it falls under common Article II's definition. IACs by proxy occur when one state attacks another state through a non-state armed group, or NSAG. An NSAG is an organized armed group that is not part of a state's official armed forces. You'll be hearing a lot more about NSAGs when we move into the section on non-international armed conflicts. So to establish an IAC by proxy, the attacking state must have overall control of the NSAG, meaning that the state equips and finances the NSAG and coordinates the general planning of its military activity. And if the state does not have overall control of the NSAG, the IHL of NIACs is applied. The IHL of IACs also applies in situations of occupation where all or part of a state's territory comes under effective control of hostile armed forces, even if the occupation is not met with armed resistance. Occupation is included in Common Article 2, which defines IACs, as we remember, so it's governed by the same rules. There are three requirements to establish an occupation and trigger the application of the IHL of IACs in this situation. First, one state must have effective control of all or part of another state's territory. The territorial state must have lost effective control of the territory, and the territorial state must not have consented to the occupying state's presence in the area. So with these criteria, it makes practical sense that the IHL of IACs would apply in situations of occupation because the definition requires both parties to be states, not NSAGs. This automatically satisfies our rule of thumb for IACs because there is a state on both sides of the conflict. So now we'll shift gears and discuss non-international con armed conflicts or NIACs. Though international armed conflicts are generally more well known, NIACs are far more common and make up the vast majority of armed conflicts that we see across the world. Article three, common to the Geneva Conventions, sets out the definition for a NIAC, which is an armed conflict not of an international character occurring in the territory of one of the high contracting parties. Because NIACs are defined as conflicts not of an international character, our rule of thumb is, if there is not a state on both sides, the conflict is a NIAC as long as the relevant conditions are fulfilled. 
So situations that are commonly classified as NIACs included a state versus a non-state armed group or NSAG, an NSAG versus another NSAG, and situations of foreign intervention where a foreign state joins the side of another state in a pre-existing NIAC, which might sound a little bit complicated. <laughs> so there are two requirements to establish a NIAC. First, violence must reach the, a sufficient intensity. Now, this is different from IACs, if we remember, because there was no specific intensity threshold required for the act of violence under the ICRC definition. And second, the NSAG or NSAGs involved must be sufficiently organized. Now, these two requirements are not explicitly mentioned anywhere in the Geneva Conventions or in Additional Protocol 2, which governs NIACs. Instead, they come from the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, or the ICTY, in its landmark Tadic case. So in the Tadic case, the ICTY laid out certain factors that need to be considered for each part of the NIAC analysis. For the threshold of violence requirement, factors to be considered include the number, duration, and intensity of individual confrontations, the type of weapons used, the number and caliber of ammunitions fired, the number of persons and the type of forces partaking in the fighting, the number of casualties, the extent of the material destruction, and the number of civilians fleeing the violence. So all of these factors are considered together on a case-by-case -case basis to determine whether the violence has reached the necessary threshold to be deemed a NIAC. The ICTY also laid out factors to be considered in the analysis of the NSAG's level of organization, including the existence of a command structure and disciplinary rules, the existence of a headquarters, whether the NSAG has control over a certain territory, the NSAG's ability to gain access to weapons, military equipment, and military training, the ability to plan, coordinate, and carry out military operations, the ability to define a unified military strategy, and finally, the ability to speak with one voice in negotiations and agreements with other parties. Just like the factors for the threshold of violence requirement, all of these are considered together on a case-by-case -case basis to determine whether the NSAG or NSAGs involved have the necessary level of organization. So let's see how these factors would be evaluated in a real scenario. In Mali in 2012, Tuareg rebel, rebel groups launched attacks on towns in northern Mali. After Mali's president was deposed, the umbrella organization in charge of these rebel groups declared the independence of Azawad in northern Mali. Now, the attacks on towns were carried out over a few months and resulted in the deaths of hundreds of Malian soldiers. The ICRC reported that 30,000 people were internally displaced because of the fighting. This particular rebellion was marked by a significant increase in heavy weapons use. So weighing these factors together, the violence reached a sufficient intensity to fulfill the first requirement for establishing a NIAC. The National Movement for the Liberation of Azawad, or the MNLA, is the umbrella organization composed of the Tuareg NSAGs that were involved in this conflict. The MNLA has a hierarchical structure, including an executive committee and regional bureaus that implement directives on the local level. Azawad, the territory that fell under the control of the rebel groups, encompassed about 60% of Mali's total land area. The MNLA also has a designated spokesman who speaks with that unified voice of the movement and who made the official declaration of Azawad's independence. So these factors contributed to the conclusion that the MNLA was sufficiently organized for the conflict to classify as a NIAC. Like the IHL of IAX, the IHL of NIAX comes primarily from three sources. Article three, common to the Geneva Conventions, defines NIAX and creates a sort of mini convention that lays out the basic guarantee of humane treatment and a, list of pro and a list of prohibited acts against those not participating in hostilities. Common Article Three is the only provision of the Geneva Conventions that applies to NIACs. Now, 141 out of the 161 customary IHL rules also apply to NIACs and are binding on all parties. And finally, Additional Protocol 2 is applicable only to NIACs and supplements Common Article 3 by extending certain protections to the wounded and sick and to civilians. 
However, AP2 has a heightened threshold of applicability, so it only applies to certain types of NIACs. Now, I'll refer to this type of NIAC as the AP2 type NIAC. The two base requirements for a NIAC, intensity of violence and NSAG organization, still apply here. AP2 adds three additional requirements to establish this type of NIAC. First, the state's armed forces must be involved, so AP2 cannot apply to NIACs that are only between two or more non-state armed groups. Second, the conflict must occur on the state's territory. And third, the NSAG must have control over part of the state's territory, which then allows the NSAG to conduct sustained and concerted military operations and to comply with AP2. This third requirement touches on the motivations behind creating AP2, which is that the existing IHL at the time was often impracticable for non-state armed groups to implement. For example, the guarantee of due process for detained and interned people would be difficult for an NSAC to implement, as they often don't have formal judicial systems in place. AP2 extends many of the obligations that are normally placed upon states to NSACs, so this is why this heightened level of group organization and control is required. To sum up our discussion on international versus non-international armed conflicts, I'll take you through three key distinctions between IACs and NIACs that can help you to understand how IHL applies in each. First, combatant and POW status only exist in IACs, not in NIACs. In NIACs, the equivalent of the combatant versus civilian distinction is made between people directly participating in hostilities and those who are not, including members of the armed forces who are hors de combat. The lack of combatant status also means that combatant privilege and immunity do not exist in non-international armed conflicts. So fighters do not have a right to participate in hostilities or an immunity from being prosecuted for doing so. And instead of POW status and the rights that come along with it, NIACs just apply a blanket guarantee of humane treatment for those not participating in hostilities. The second key distinction is the parties that are intended to be bound by IHL. As I've touched on throughout this presentation, the IHL of IACs was created with states in mind, while the IHL of NIACs, and particularly AP2, was created with NSAG practicality in mind. The final key distinction concerns the application of the law of occupation. Now to remind you, the law of occupation requires that both the occupying and occupied states or parties be states, not NSAGs, so it cannot apply in non-international armed conflicts. Now that we've gone through both international and non-international armed conflicts, I'd like to touch on what's called double classification, meaning situations that can be considered both an IAC and a NIAC. This most commonly occurs in situations of foreign intervention where there is an existing NIAC between a state and an NSAG and a foreign state enters into this conflict in support of the NSAG and against the territorial state. When this happens, the conflict between the NSAG and the territorial state remains a NIAC, while an, a new IAC is established between the foreign state and the territorial state. So now we're gonna move into the interactive portion of this webinar. So I'm gonna to describe to you a hypothetical scenario and I'll ask you to decide which law you think should apply. It'll be between the IHL of IACs, the IHL of NIACs, the IHL of both IACs and NIACs, meaning double classification, or neither, meaning that no conflict has been established. So for our first hypothetical scenario, State A enters State B's territory and attacks a nearby military encampment, causing damage to military equipment, and takes three members of State B's armed forces captive. State B did not consent to this action. So which law applies? And I'll ask my team member to open up the poll. I'll give you all a minute to answer this question. 
Okay, I'm seeing a lot of people picking one option. So it's looking like a almost a consensus. Okay, I'll give it a I'll give it a few more seconds for those those people still deciding out there. Okay, perfect. We'll go ahead and end that one. So let's, okay, share those results. So it looks like most of you did get it correct. The correct answer is A, the IHL of IAX. So state A committed an act of violence against another state, state B, by attacking the military encampment and capturing three soldiers. This aligns with our rule of thumb for IAX as there is a state on both sides of this conflict. Okay, so. Now we will move on to the second question. All right, an NSAG is engaged in an existing NIAC against state A in state A's territory. Assume that all criteria for establishing a NIAC have been met. And now state B enters this conflict in support of state A, which law applies? Okay, I'll, I'll give you all a couple more seconds to, to decide. This one's a little bit more difficult. So I understand, you know, needing to take some time to think about it. Okay, I'll go ahead and end there. So most of you did get the correct answer, which was B, the IHL of NIAX. So this conflict, this conflict stays a NIAC because the two states are only on one side of the conflict. Remember, our rule of thumb for IAX is that there needs to be a state on both sides. So because both states are only on one side, this is a non-international armed conflict. Okay. And for our final question, an NSAG is engaged in an existing NIAC against state A in state A's territory. This is gonna look a little familiar. Assume all criteria for establishing a NIAC have been met. This time, state B enters the conflict in support of the NSAG, not state A. Which law applies here? All right, seeing a lot of responses. I'm loving this, this is great. I'll give it a couple more seconds for everybody to get in their final answers. All right, I'll go ahead and end it there. And wow, you, you're all experts because most of you got the correct answer, which was C. It's uh, both the, I, or I, the IHL of both IAX and NIAX. So this is a classic example of double classification where the conflict between state A and the NSAG remains a NIAC while the new conflict between state A and state B is an IAC. So I anticipated that that was gonna be a, a more difficult question. So you should all pat yourselves on the back. All right. So to wrap up, I'd like to touch on what ends a conflict, which is not always very clear. The application of IHL in conflicts ends at the general close of military operations and not just the end of hostilities. In the case of an IAC, this can be the withdrawal of foreign troops from the territorial state's territory. It can also take the form of a formal dec declaration or peace agreement, as long as military operations are in fact closed. Now the word general in general close means that the military operations must be closed between all allies on all sides of the conflict. For situations of occupation, IHL ceases to apply at the termination of the occupier's effective control of the area. So that brings us to the end of this webinar. Um, if you'd like to learn more about IHL and, and what our team does, feel free to scan the QR code here. And um, now I'll, I'll be happy to take any questions through the chat or through the um, Q&A um, 
function on the Zoom and my lovely co cohort, Natalie, is going to be um, reading them out for me. So thank you all. Thank you all so much for, for being here. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Olivia. That was a fascinating uh, webinar and a really, truly insightful discussion. Um, definitely gave me a lot more clarity on the classification of conflict. So I appreciate it. Those questions were tricky. Um, but I think, uh, yes, please give Olivia a, a big round of applause. But I think a question that some of our audience members may have is, um, who, who makes that official decision um, as to the classification of a, of a conflict? Right. So, you know, there's actually no one governing body that makes that official decision. Um, but parties like the ICRC, the UN Security Council, or the ICC use these frameworks that are applied universally to come to their own decision. And then that decision can sometimes influence other parties to come to the same conclusion and, and apply that framework in the same way based on their analysis. And, um, and actually, if anyone is interested in uh, more breakdowns of how these frameworks are applied, I'd like to point you to RULAC, R-U-L-A-C, which is an excellent site. It gives really detailed um, explanations of why conflicts are classified the way that they are. So if you're interested in learning more, um, I would definitely point you in that direction. But yeah, great question. Wonderful, that's super helpful. Um, we did have another question actually from our audience. Uh, Al asked, how, how would you uh, analyze a conflict involving highly organized um, and armed drug cartels? Yeah, so these, these kinds of conflicts, um, they, they can become NIACs in certain situations, but it's, it's often really difficult to attribute violence to a specific armed group in the situation. As you remember, there's that requirement that they have to be sufficiently organized. Um, and if it's a lot of different groups engaging in, in one large conflict, it's often difficult to identify a hierarchical structure or, or a command center. Um, things like that. And so it, it really depends on a case by case basis. But I, you know, as these frameworks are applied universally, I would encourage you to, if you have a specific one in mind, um, you know, maybe apply it yourself and see, see how, you know, you would come out on one way or the other in a specific conflict. No, that's super useful. Um, definitely a very interesting question. Uh, we did have another question that came in. And that one was from um, Robert, who asked, how does this classification of, of armed conflicts apply to the American Red Cross or maybe even the, the um, ICRC? Yeah, so the ICRC, as I mentioned a little bit before, um, they, they're a body that are oftentimes uh, making, making a decision about how a conflict is classified in one way or the other. Um, and, and a big part of the ICRC and the American Red Cross mission is IHL dissemination, right? And I think um, using, using conflicts that have been established in the past that, have, um, that are ongoing currently can help with that. Um, I think you know, if we see things going on in the news, people are more likely to engage with IHL and to learn about, you know, why, why conflicts are um, governed by certain rules or not governed by others. Um, it, can also, uh, it can also affect how humanitarian actors engage with, uh, with certain conflicts in certain areas of the world. Um, and so whether this be a national Red Cross or Red Crescent Society um, or, or another humanitarian body, so it, it does engage in a lot of ways. I'd say the biggest, yeah, definitely, definitely the IHL dissemination part of, of the overall mission. Great, thank you for that clarification. Um, briefly, would you mind uh, going over some of the abbreviation definitions again, just for, for our audience members? Yeah, so um, I'll go through some, and if I'm missing any, um, feel free to send it in the chat if there's a specific one that you weren't sure about. So first with the conflicts, we have IAC, International Armed Conflict, and then NIAC, um, Non-International Armed Conflict. That one can be hard to differentiate when people say it out loud, so I totally get the, the confusion that might come up there. 
We also have NSAGs, which are non-state armed groups. Again, those groups that are organized but not part of um, a state's um, official armed forces. Um, let's see, what am I? What other abbreviations did I have? Oh, I guess the ICTY was in there, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia um, and, and with their landmark Tadic case. So they were the, the International Tri Criminal Tribunal that um, established the, um, the factors to be weighed in the NIAC analysis. Um, yeah, if, there, if there's any others that I'm missing that, that this person was asking about, please send it in the chat. No, I think that's great. I think you you touched on on the main ones. Um, uh, we did have a question. If state A is engaged in cyber attacks on state B, when would that uh, count as as an international armed conflict? Yeah, so this is a really good question. Um, the key here is kind of the definition of an attack and what is considered an attack um, versus just espionage, for example. Um, so you want to consider the destructive and disruptive nature of the operation. Um, is it, you know, enough to be considered an act of violence, which is required to establish an IAC? And um, I'll refer you to the Tallinn Manual. Um, the 3.0 version is going to be out in the near future and it and it discusses this a little bit um and so um yeah that's that's the answer i have right now it's not always um clear again a lot of these decisions are made on a case-by-case -case basis um and so it would have but it would have to rise to the threshold of what's defined as an attack wonderful no really fascinating question i think it's it's definitely going to be a relevant one going forward um, another question that came in, who's going to be there to guarantee compliance with the Geneva Conventions uh, once the, this classification has been made, whether it's, a, it's an international or a non-international armed conflict? Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, so ensuring compliance with the Geneva Conventions really is a global collective responsibility. Um, at the international level, there's entities like the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, um, they play a crucial role in monitoring and promoting compliance during conflict, you know, between all of the parties involved. Um, and, and also, you know, individual states have a duty to educate their armed forces and the general public about the rules of the Geneva Conventions and assure and ensure that their violations are being prosecuted, whether domestically under universal jurisdiction or, or promoting, um, say, um, an action by the ICC or the ICJ. Um, so I guess ultimately, while organizations like the ICRC can monitor and report um, viol potential violations, the primary responsibility is, you know, it's going to be resting on the states and, and their national legal systems to ensure that, um, that accountability. Wonderful. Uh, we did actually receive a, qu a question quickly. This one, this one should be uh, straightforward for you, but how would you classify the conflict in Ukraine? Oh, that one. It's, I mean, it's a perfect example of an international armed conflict or IAC. So as we know, um, back in February of 2022, Russia invades Ukraine. Um, it's actually very similar to, to the case study World War II that I, that I did a couple slides back um, with the invasion of Poland. So that invasion was an act of violence against another state. You know, obviously Ukraine is, is a, a state, it's a fully recognized state. So um, that was the action that established that IAC. Fantastic, very, very interesting. Um, we received a question from Artemis what if state a does a strike but it's surgical on state b um uh, but denies it um with that can i ask what what you mean by surgical i may be just unfamiliar with what that's asking yeah i'm not sure if um Artemis is available to to expand on that, but um, I believe surgical uh, strikes are are meant to minimize collateral damage and and only attack legitimate military um, targets. So I think yeah. so I think there's that sort of 
So from my understanding, um, I mean, surgical strikes are essentially attacks that are adhering to the principle of distinction, which is the requirement under IHL to distinguish between um, civilians and civilian objects on one side and then military objectives and um, like it, legitimate military objectives on the other side. So surgical strikes are only only attacking legitimate military objectives. Um, I'd say you know, if, it, if state A is denying it, I guess it would depend on how clear is it that they've actually committed this attack. Again, this is, I, I don't want to kind of give you a, one, one, an answer one way or the other because it's, there's not really enough facts here in the question to be able to give you an affirmative answer. If it's, if they're denying it, but it's extremely obvious that they have committed this attack, um, it likely would, if a conflict has not yet been established, it may be sufficient. Um, if it's a little bit more fuzzy about whether they caused this attack or not, that's where you get into, there's, there's going to be a lot of legal scholars out there doing this analysis. Um, so I'm sorry if that wasn't quite the answer you were looking for, but, um, but I, I think with that kind of situation, you'd need a little bit more facts to understand, um, how it would come out. No, that's wonderful. And, and Artemis, thank you. Thank you so much for the, the really interesting question and and for clarifying in the chat um but i think i think that might bring us to the end of our questions a very engaging audience um i think we're we're at the end now and i'm going to leave it for a couple couple minutes but uh if you had any closing comments olivia please take it away yeah and and thank you natalie for for being a brilliant moderator and question asker. Um, well, I, I'll just thank you all for coming today, um, you know, taking time out of your day, your work day to come hear a law student talk. Um, I really appreciate it. I hope you learned something. Um, even if you're already, you know, a professional in the IHL fields, um, I hope you found this valuable and, and informative and engaging. So yeah, thank you all for coming and I, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day receiving lots of love in the chat. So thank you so much, Olivia. This was a really brilliant primer. Uh, definitely gave us a lot more clarity on the topic. Thank you.